So then we start with the first group work. Um, the thing was here that uh, we would like to uh, to say something about a company that uh, faces difficulties and they are looking for uh, ways to reduce costs. One of the ways that they can reduce costs is to move their activities to China. And this is uh, will cause some severe consequences where you will have a loss of direct employment and a loss in direct production value. So then we are uh, in, this, in a situation where we are going to start with an input-output analysis to say something about how this uh, offshoring or out moving out of this industry will affect the production value and the employment value. And secondly, <coughs> we will then try to say something about uh, this is a, a thing where we improve the transport infrastructure and we'll see what happens in the, for the input-output study if we change some of, the, some of the technical coefficients in the transaction table. And then <coughs> we turn to a situation where we will like to see the more long-term effects of a possible relocation to China by using this four-step calder dixon turbo model. And then we, I give you the data, the, the multiplier, which can be taken from the previous exercise if you manage to solve it, or I give you just one, one coefficient to, to avoid leaving you stranded if you don't manage to solve 1a, then you use 1.5. You <coughs> calculate the, the, the change in, uh, in output. Uh, and you can do that by, by uh, computing the uh, share of the per percentage, per percentage of reduced production value as, uh, as a percentage of the total exporting value. You do that first, and then <coughs> you start by calculating equation four, and, uh, and uh, you use the information on the underlying production value, the Fordorn coefficient, the wage increase, uh, the elasticity, pri direct price elasticity, the cross price elasticity with the prices on the, in, the, in the world market, and the income elasticity in the world market. And then I say that <coughs> compute with the changes in world market prices and world market income with zero. And secondly, if you get a price increase of 2% in the global market for the competing products and a rather strong increase in income global income, the income in the market which you export to, of 4%. So in the latter case, it is obvious that the world market will help you, or this region, this exporting region, to overcome the negative impacts of uh, this company moving to China. And then I'll show you the solution very quickly. Here, we, I, I use this reduced production value and I use the coefficients. This is agriculture, manufacturing industry and service. So reduced production value can be considered as reduced output from manufacturing industry. And, they, and the technical coefficients are, uh, are 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. 
which gives a primary effect of 300 millions of reduced output in addition to the 600 that we lose from the moving of the, of the factory. And then the second order effects. Then we have reduced input or reduced demand for agriculture. And the technical coefficient for agriculture is 0 0.2 for agriculture. Manufacturing industry 0 0.2 and nothing from zero from services. 60 is uh, reduced demand for uh, supplies for the manufacturing industry. And again, using the same coefficients as above. 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. And for service, correspondingly. A reduced input of 120, which gives in the second round <coughs> a reduced, reduced uh, output for services of 2 plus 12 plus 12 is 24 millions. And if you add horizontally, you get a second round effect of 102. And the same, and then the same exercise for, for the third round. And you get, you see that this approaches zero quite rapidly. So we stop with three rounds and we get a multiplier of 1.74, which is simply the result if you take 0 uh, or 1042.2 and divide by 600, you get 1.74, which is the correct multiplier. And I saw that some of you had, had made that uh, correctly. Uh, and I asked about a reduction of 270 man years. What, what could be the result? And I said that using the same multiplier, give a total employment effect of 470, which is equal to 270 times 1.74. But the assumptions then are that the employment per produced unit is balanced on average. So, what I'm saying is that if employment in some of the, let's say, sub-industries, the supplying industries, are lower per output unit, this, this number is biased. It may be higher or lower than 470. But that information we don't have at hand, so, so it's, this type of answer is, is uh, sufficient for this. And then <coughs> we, um, we uh, can address 1C where we can uh, say that if you increase the import coefficients then you actually say that you will substitute some of the domestic suppliers with imports to the region. And then you can recalculate with, let's say, improved import coefficients and reduced technical coefficients for some of the domestic industries because the, the, the sum of coefficients column-wise should always be 1.0. So if you increase the import coefficients, you have to reduce the domestic industry coefficients. And you can, you can then argue that the effects for, the, for this region will be smaller. I mean, the, the, the production value and the employment value for the region will be smaller if the improved transport infrastructure will increase competition with foreign regions. So that is what I, I said on the lecture that if you improve the transport infrastructure towards the EU, to, towards Europe, some of, the, uh, some of the Norwegian domestic industries may face increased competition 
from that. Then we turn on to this uh, four-step model. I gave you some directions for solving it. Reduced <coughs> exports in, uh, in percent is 5. 0 0.6 billions divided by 12 billions gives 5, which is x. C0 is 1.74, or you use 1.5 if you did manage to solve exercise 1. And then you go through this, uh, these calculations, plugging in the numbers as you have been given, and you see that uh, this reduction in, uh, in productivity will be 2.4% because you, you suffer from a reduced uh, production. And this Ferdoin coefficient uh, <coughs> contributes to a, uh, a reduction in the, in the productivity because of the because the size of the reduced size of the economic system takes productivity a bit down. The <coughs> wage effect of that is negative in the sense that when you reduce productivity and you have a wage growth of 3%, the resulting wage growth will be 5.4, which is not beneficial because then you are in a situation where the demand for your products will be reduced by the price elasticity and you don't get much help from the world market because you don't have any growth in, uh, in prices or in income so the resulting effect will be a reduction of almost 5% in reduced exports. But if you consider that the second situation, the other situation where the, where the prices in the world market increases with 2% and the income with 4%, you will, the, the world market will actually help you out with a growth in exports of 0.6%. Even if you lose this big company to, to another country, so if this company chooses to move to China. So the world market development is often crucial. And then we continue with a new round of events here. We see that as time goes by, this tends to level off a bit. So in the, in the, in the second year, you will have a, uh, a, an effect like this in output, an effect like this in, uh, in uh, and then in year three, you get a positive development in world markets, you get the uh, productivity effect of 2.5% positive, whereas it is minus 2% negative if you don't get any help in the world market by increased prices and, and demand, and so on. So this is a way of illustrating the linkages and the fact that uh, as time goes by, size of the economic system uh, increased or decreased productivity and not last but not least, the situation in the world market will play a significant role here. So this was group work number one. Group work number two was, was more theoretical. And it, uh, it went like this. Uh, I asked about Let's, I just asked you to more or less replicate the, the, the chapter on Hotling's location theory and, uh, and, uh, and, the, th and the theory who, who, which discussed spatial competition uh, and uh, the ability to use space as a, as a competitive factor, even if you had higher production costs and higher transport costs, you might still be able to survive in a limited 
space. You had a fraction of the market. So I, <coughs> I started here with this, uh, this uh, classical uh, uh, hoteling situation where you should discuss and show graphically the process leading to a location in the middle. Uh, discuss why this was, was a result and also perhaps why it is a sustainable result. Namely that companies are in the competition not on prices but on quality and other aspects. They are in a monopolistic competition. But with, if, <coughs> if the companies are, let's say, either more equal, they produce more equal substitutes of the products in the first place, or they become more equal as time goes by, you may enter into a price competition. <coughs> and I wanted you to discuss that. Because it is quite important if you are located together in an area, not to try to imitate your neighbor, but to try to have a certain strategic distance so that you don't end up in a price war. That is important if you are located close to another competitor. You can compete, but try to avoid a pure price competition. That is why <laughs> if you see shopping malls, big shopping malls, you may have two different or three or four different uh, shops selling clothing, apparel, but you can feel pretty sure that you don't have companies selling the same type of clothing. They may be in the upmarket fashion, in the lower market, everyday clothing, and you may have clothing for uh, outdoor activities, clothing for yeah, what have you. The point is that they are strategically different. They are not addressing exactly the same market. And hence they are not in a, I mean it goes without saying, it's no point to have a price competition between outdoor garment and fashion, let's say for uh, parties and so on. So that's what I mean by strategic distance. And then I <coughs> asked you to come up with an example or two for your home region. And then I, <coughs> I asked you to, to, uh, to discuss the, the market shares for two companies where conditions changed a bit with uh, changes in transport costs and production costs. And then I proceeded with some Weberian, Weber considerations. This was a company with, with um, different technical efficiency. One company were able, were able to produce with 80% units, 80% of the final production Final products were working, 20% defects, whereas the other producer wasn't able to make with less than 50% defects. And I asked you to discuss two, two different locations. I will be a bit conscious not to introduce too many, let's say, or I will try to actually avoid questions that needs a, let's say, location-specific knowledge, because that will not be fair to, to, to students who are from quite different parts of the world. So uh, this, uh, this Grenland Denmark case and, uh, and the Molde Fjord case is, uh, is perhaps not what I would like to, I would not like to, to take that approach at the exam because it, it will favor people who are from the, the specific regions. I can ask about bigger cities, smaller cities, regions, centers, so on and so forth, uh, generic questions, but uh, not r uh, related to specific cities or specific areas. 
because that will not be fair. But the essence, the, the, the logic of the questions may, may still be valid for, for the exam. No? So this is, uh, this is a Weberian uh, exercise, uh, including uh, changes in the framework conditions for, for location. Um, we proceeded with... Uh, hmm. A bit slow. I don't know why this is happening. Questions four <coughs> was about also Weber. Molde is in the middle of uh, of the county with uh, Olsen, Kristiansund cities, Odalsnes, with access to the eastern part of Norway and also to the Oslo main cargo terminal and the export markets. And some improved infrastructure will be built in this direction and in this direction, perhaps. It's fairly good in this direction. And I just asked you to reflect upon what could be the consequence for Molde's, Molde's strategic position as a manufacturing center when you have a, a structure like this. So you need to discuss that on, on fairly fairly intuitive grounds, but based on the theory then. Question five was about urban structures. And then you need to present your, your hometown briefly and, uh, and then try to categorize it and also say something about future development. And then I'm concerned with the path dependency issue, which I, uh, which I uh, discussed in connection with lecture eight, that it's hard to get from a dispersed city heavily dependent on motorized car transport and to turn that into a dense city with focus on walking, cycling, public transport instead of car use. And you have got the hints for solution. Uh, I have just indicated where you can find support for your answers. I would like to have a graphical illustration of the point of departure to the possible end result, which is then location in the middle. And also the second stage development with price war from a location in the middle, where the prices shifts downwards and where one of the players are likely to go bankrupt. on page 280 and 281 discusses the conditions which need to be present for this co-location to be sustainable. And it's good to mention them as well when you re answer the question. This is, describes the, the price competition and the price, <coughs> the le conditions leading to such price wars, wars are also <coughs> relevant to mention. Then, I uh, challenged you to, uh, <laughs> to come up with some real-world examples of location behavior. I described it A and uh, <coughs> the, some of the handed-in answers has been quite good in, in describing the real-world real world examples that can, il that can sort of be explained from this, uh, this hoteling competition, location competition behavior. And then <coughs> question two is, is given, the solution is given on a separate sheet of paper here. Ah, I don't know how to rotate this, uh, but um, the logic is that you have this line going from zero to 100. L, and in point 30 and 60 kilometers from zero, you have two companies. Company A with production cost of two, company B with a production cost of three. <coughs> in 
you have a transport cost of 0 0.2 per kilometer, meaning that for 20 kilometers, the transport costs increases prices by two, up to four, on each side of the location. Whereas producer B had 0 0.05 units of transport cost per kilometer, meaning that for 20, uh, for, uh, for, um, 20 kilometers, the price increases by one. So the distribution of activities between A and B will be that A will be within this area <coughs> where, the, where the transport costs, where the costs are, uh, are favorable. And B will be the lowest, will have the lowest costs on each side. So we have B, A and B distributed like this. A will have this small market. And in question 2B, <coughs> I asked what will happen if, um, if um, what was the question there again? I'll have to see. If company A manages to reduce its transport cost down to B le B's level, so that we have this situation with the dotted lines here. So the transport costs are lowered from this level to this level in both directions. We will have distribution like this. So this will be the intersection point where B takes over and everything to the, to the, to the left will be in A's position up to this. And then <coughs> the third scenario was that uh, the production costs are kept as in A, but uh, the production, the, the transport cost was kept as in question A. The only difference is that the produ production cost for producer B is reduced to A's level, namely to two. And then we see that <coughs> the market share for A is, is somewhat reduced. B takes more on the left hand side and a bit more on the right hand side and we get a contraction of A's market. But not not very much, but A is left with a, a smaller share of the market. If we continue with uh, question three, I am just saying that the least efficient producer should be located closest to the suppliers. Hence that in southern Denmark, because they take the supplies from France and, and Poland, because they need more supplies per produced unit, that actually works. And I refer to the, to, the, to the corresponding section in the paper collection. When you reduce the quality of the output, you need more input to produce one unit and get it to the market. So hence, the least efficient producer will tend to locate closer to the supplies because they simply need more supplies to get one unit to the market. Then <coughs> I uh, asked about what will happen if one of the producers has been off uh, uh, is offered cheap location. And then I referred to these, the pan analysis. And this situation will be most relevant for producer one who is already in Norway because they are more efficient in terms of, uh, of uh, the use of input. And <coughs> they need to consider any added transport costs of the relocation to Hamar from Grenland. They may, might need to spend a bit more on transport to the market for the end users. And they need to consider that added transport costs up against the reduced costs of location in Hamar. And I refer to the relevant pages for the discussion. 
And you can also extend the discussion by looking at page 270 to 271, which actually discusses that this producer could change suppliers if there are relevant suppliers in the area of Hamar. And they could also perhaps add uh, change, I mean, they can perhaps also change the composition of the end user market. Perhaps they then comes closer to an area with, uh, with the cabins that uh, constitutes the market for this, these solar, sol solar panels. So these dynamics, these dynamics that are discussed here can also be introduced. Then we have this long text of describing changes in infrastructure around Molde and how that can affect Molde's competitive position as, uh, as, a, as a, in terms of location, in terms of, uh, of manufacturing. And then I just say that this is a bit local. I will not use such local cases at the exam as I already said. But here, Molde is shown in the middle of a Weberian triangle where the exports to the main markets go via Andalsnes. The idea is that Molde's central location in this triangle can be favored by easier access to supply markets in Olsen and Kristiansund because of the fixed links. Then the supplier industries can be mapped, mapped. By that I mean that you can try to analyze what is the let's say, the structure of the supplying industries in the, in the two cities, and can they be sort of used to support a strengthening of the, of the manufacturing industry in Molde with collaboration and, uh, and everything. And uh, <coughs> you could also use that information to say something about which types of industries should you try to attract given that you have knowledge about the supplying industries in these two areas. Of course, you could also say that Molde can be a supporting industry to the manufacturing industry in Ålesund, Kristiansund. That is also, could also be a part of this discussion. And then, question four about what could happen if you, uh, if you set up a cordon toll ring around the city center to, to finance new infrastructure. To improve the traffic flows. And then I would like you to discuss the factors listed in the table. Not all of them may be relevant. Some others may perhaps be more relevant. I would say that, <coughs> uh, or I have listed some of the, some of the perhaps more, most relevant examples, project expenditures, uh, consumer expenditures, as I mentioned uh, earlier today, F impact on retail and tourism, <coughs> property values and development, and so on. Wealth accumulation, for instance, is perhaps not the topic that w I would have focused on when answering this. So you need to be selective and try to work out which elements are important here. Question five. <coughs> I refer to this again, as I've said already. Um, then if you get something like this on the, on the exam, please then try to just sketch a map of how this, your home time looks, looks like. The location of the city center, the central business district with the shops and uh, the main economic activities. And if there are any suburbs, please try to just indicate them on, on, a, on, a, on a sketch. And, uh, and the road network and the public transport lines. I don't demand any, <laughs> any high level of precision, just a sketch, if you get something like this. 
and then you can use that sketch to argue what is the category, the structure, and also what may be the likely development path in this. Okay, so that's it. I will stop here. Wish you good luck with the exam. And, uh, and as I have posted on Fronter, if you want to submit a draft of your mandatory assignment, you can do that in Fronter. You have to do it before the 10th of May. I will give you a response within a very few days because you have a, the exam on the 19th, so you don't have much time. I will try to do it within the within the 13th of May. But then you have to, I will give only short comments. And, uh, and uh, please also then, when you write your assignment, bear in mind the regulations connected to the length and so on, and try to keep within a reasonable. I don't mind plus minus page or two, but please try to keep within the directions of the, when it comes to the length of the paper and so on. Okay, thank you.